Order. Questions to the Prime Minister. Mr Julian Knight. Yeah. Number one, Mr Speaker. <laughs> Thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, this morning I had meetings with ministerial colleagues and others, and in addition to my duties in this House, I shall have further such meetings later today. Mr Julian Knight. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I'd like to echo the sentiments expressed earlier by the Prime Minister and all in this place in relation to Her Majesty the Queen. Yeah. 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 Will the Prime Minister join me today in congratulating parents of the newly announced Solihull Alternative Provision Academy, providing vital places for those with complex behavioural needs? Yeah. Would he also agree with me that those opposite, who would scrap free schools, would deny parents' choice and children opportunity? Yeah. I, I think my honourable friend is absolutely right. I think the free schools movement is bringing what we need in this country, which is more good and outstanding school places. We have over 250 such schools already in existence. We want to see 500 set up over this parliament. What we've seen so far is a quarter of free schools are classed as outstanding. And I think, uh, but instead of the uh, education spokesman you know, s s speaking out today, perhaps you should praise the fact that a quarter of free schools are outstanding schools. Yeah. In addition to that, these are not just what he rather called condescendingly schools for yummy mummies. They are providing special schools, alternative provision schools. They're enhancing educational provision in our country, and we should be proud of the people who set them up. Prime Minister about the refugee crisis. This is the largest movement of people across Europe since the Second World War. Within just one month, over 50,000 refugees arriving in Greece and thousands more setting off on foot to go from Hungary to Austria. The Prime Minister committed on Monday that we would accept 20,000 Syrian refugees over the next five years. But for these people, 2020 must seem a lifetime away. Can he tell the House how many will be allowed to come to the UK by the end of this year? First of all, Mr Speaker, before I answer the Right Honourable Lady's question, I'm sure the whole House will join me in paying tribute to her 28 years of front bench service as it potentially comes to an end this week. She has served with distinction in both opposition and government. Twice she stepped into the breach as her party's acting leader. Never an easy job, but she's carried it out with total assurance. She's always been a robust adversary across these dispatch boxes and a fierce champion for a range of issues, most notably women's rights, where she's often led the way in changing attitudes in our country for the better. And although we haven't always seen eye to eye, she has served her constituents, her party and this House with distinction from the front bench, and I wish her well as she continues to serve this House and our country from the back benches. Yeah. And turning to the specific issue she raised, she's absolutely right. This is the biggest crisis facing Europe. We have to act on all of the areas that she mentions. We have to use our head and our heart. We've committed to taking 20,000 people. I want us to get on with that. There's no limit on the amount of people that could come in the first year. Let's get on with it, but let's recognise we have to go to the camps, we have to find the people, we have to make sure they can be housed, we have to find schools for their children, we have to work with local councils and local voluntary bodies to make sure that when these people come, they get a warm welcome from Britain. Yeah. Harriet Harman. Well, can I thank him for his generous words um, about me uh, on the front bench and just say that, uh, for me, it has been an absolute um, honour and a privilege to play my part in leading this great party. Um, we have to do all those things that he set out in relation to uh, the refugees, but we still do need to know and we need to have a commitment about the number that we will take this year. This is an urgent crisis. If he can't give us a number today, can he at least commit to go away and consult with local authorities, with throughout government, with um, uh, voluntary organisations and charities, and come back in a month and say how many this country will take this year. It is welcome that the Prime Minister has said we will take in Syrian refugees from the camps in the region, but he's ruled out those who have already made it to southern Europe. 
We understand that his argument is not wanting more people to put themselves in danger, but we've got to deal with the reality, and the reality is that there are already thousands, including thousands of children without their parents, who have arrived in Europe. Save the Children have proposed that we take 3,000 of them into this country. Surely we should be playing our part to help those most vulnerable children, even if they are already in Europe. Will he reconsider this? Um, well, well, first of all, on the, the, the number we can achieve over the coming year, we have a meeting on Friday, the first meeting of the committee that's going to be jointly chaired by the Home Secretary and the Community Secretary. At that meeting, we want to invite representatives of the LGA, Local Government Association, and possibly some of the voluntary bodies as well, to make sure we can plan. Because it's, of course, one thing to give a commitment to a number, whether it's the 20,000 that I think is right or something else. It's another thing to actually make sure you can find these people, get them here, and give them a warm welcome. I, I hope now the whole country can come together in making sure we deliver uh, this effort properly. The second point she raises about uh, Europe, and she talks about the reality I in Europe, I, I would say that there's also a bigger reality, which is there are 11 million Syrians who have been pushed out of their homes, only 3% of whom have so far decided to come to Europe. And I think it's in the interest of the Syrian people, and indeed all of us, to do everything we can to make sure that as many people as possible stay in the neighbouring countries stay in the refugee camps in preparation for one day returning to, to Syria. And that's why Britain has led the way in funding those refugee camps, funding Lebanon, funding Jordan, and will continue to go on uh, doing just that. Answering specifically her point about children, we'll go on listening to Save the Children and the excellent work they've done. Uh, a number of other organisations, expert organisations, warn about the dangers of, of taking children further away from their parents. But the point overall I'd make is those that have already arrived in Europe, they are at least safe. The ones in the refugee camps, the ones in Lebanon and Jordan, those are the ones that, if we can help, will discourage more people from making the perilous journey. And all I can say is the conversations I've had so far with the leaders of, for instance, France and Germany, they can see Britain playing her role, funding these refugee camps, meeting the 0.7% of GDP and taking 20,000 Syrians to welcome into our homes. Yeah. Harriet Harman. It's very important indeed, and we support that. But what about these thousands of children who are already many, many miles away from their home, who are already in Europe but have no home? Surely we can play our part in helping some of those children too. And I do urge him to reconsider it. And of course, planning has to be done for receiving uh, those refugees from the camps. It's right that he should be meeting with local government. But when he's develop those plans, he should come back to the House. A month is enough time to come back to the House and say how many we will take this year. This is urgent. Um, can I ask him um, about the situation of those child refugees from the camps who he said will be allowed to come here? They need sanctuary and security. We mustn't leave them living with the threat of deportation hanging over them. Can he assure us that they won't be automatically liable for deportation when they turn 18? I, I can absolutely give that assurance. The reason for resettling people uh, with these five-year humanitarian visas is it because it means you don't have to go through the normal asylum process. But the assumption is at the end of that, if people want to stay, they can apply for application to stay, and the assumption is they would be able to stay. Some may want to go back to Syria, particularly if there's been a, a settlement in Syria between now and then. Let me answer her other questions. In terms of coming back to the House, uh, obviously I will be coming back to the House on a weekly basis uh, to answer these questions and making statements and appearing in front of the Liaison Committee, but I will commit to make sure that the Home Secretary and the Community Secretary regularly update the House because this is an enormous national exercise to make sure we give a warm welcome to these 20,000 people and I'm happy for them to do that and I know members of this House want to feed into the process with offers and ideas from their own uh, local councils. Coming back again to the point about uh, children, yes we will be taking vulnerable children as we have already including orphans from camps in the region but all the while we'll be listening to the UNHCR advice who do advise caution on relocating unaccompanied children, and they apply that to the children who have already come to, to Europe as well. Harriet Harman. 
Uh, but the UNHCR don't tell us not to take children from those camps in Europe who are there without their parents. They don't. But I do welcome what he said about not having a threat of deportation over those Syrian children uh, that do come here. As, as the number of those fleeing to Europe via Turkey and Greece grows, it's right that we don't lose sight of those who are still making the perilous journey across the Mediterranean from Libya. Our Navy has rescued thousands of them already, and it's important that this level of search and rescue is maintained. Can he update the House on that? The update I can give is that so far I believe we've rescued 6,700 children. First, this was with HMS Bulwark, the flagship of the Royal Navy. Bulwark was replaced by HMS Enterprise, but Enterprise has continued this uh, very good work and will continue in, the, in doing this work with uh, allies and others as long as is necessary. We're also using the two border force cutters. But I think we should all be honest with ourselves and recognise that we have to, particularly in the case of economic migrants leaving on the African route, we do need to break the link between those people getting on a boat and getting settlement in Europe. All the evidence from uh, these sorts of migration crises in the past, particularly the example of Spain and the Canary Islands, you do need a way of returning people to Africa who are not fleeing for their lives but are leaving for a better life. Because if you can't break that link, an increasing number of people will still want to make that perilous journey. Of course, we do need to find ways of returning people where that's right, but we've also got to make sure that we stop them drowning um, at sea when they're fleeing as refugees, and I know that he agrees with that. Um, the EU must have a robust and realistic plan. Today, the European Commission has announced further steps. The Prime Minister said he would look at whether there was a need for a special summit of EU leaders. We know there's one scheduled for October. But if there ever was a need for a summit of EU leaders, that time is now. Will he call for one? Well, I'm happy to keep this under review, and I discussed it with Chancellor Merkel and uh, President Hollande in the last couple of days. The meeting of the Home Affairs and Justice Ministers will be taking place in just a couple of days' time. I think the, the, the British approach will be very clear, which is this must be a comprehensive approach. If all the focus is on redistributing quotas of refugees around Europe, that won't solve the problem, and it actually sends a message uh, to people that actually it's a good idea to get on a boat and to make that perilous journey. That's not just my view. Actually, the Chair of the Home Affairs Select Committee, who I think is absolutely right about this, has said this. The answer is not quotas. All quotas will do is play into the hands of those who exploit vulnerable refugees. So, of course, Europe has to reach its own answers for those countries that are part of Schengen. Britain, which have our own borders and our ability to make our own sovereign decisions about this, our approach is to say, yes, we are a humanitarian nation with a moral conscience, we will take 20,000 Syrians, but we want a comprehensive approach that puts money into the camps, that meets our aid commitments, that solves the problems in Syria, that has a return path to Africa, that sees a new government in Libya. We have to address all of these issues, and Britain, as a sovereign nation with our own borders, will do just that. Yeah. But this is not about Schengen, and this is not just about us as a sovereign nation doing what we can and should. This is about us working together with other countries. The refugee crisis presents a daunting problem which we are all striving to tackle. But we also have to address the underlying causes, which are conflict, global inequality and poverty. And there are no simple answers, but we can only address them working with other countries. The responsibilities we share, as well as the threats that we face, reach across borders in this globalised age. To be British is not to be narrow, inward-looking and fearful of the outside world, but to be strong, confident and proud to reach out and engage with the rest of the world. The Government should rise to this challenge of our time, and I urge him to do so. I, I, I agree with every word of what she's just said, and I would say that Britain, uniquely amongst uh, countries uh, in the world, actually meets our 2% NATO spending target, so we can play a role in terms of defence and, and helping to secure these countries, and we reach our 0.7% GDP uh, of spending on aid. No other country in the world uh, meets those two major countries in the world meets those two targets, and I'm proud that we do. She talked.
talks about going to the causes of these crises, and she's absolutely right about that. We have to be frank, particularly the Eastern Mediter Mediterranean crisis is because Assad has butchered his own people and because ISIL have, in their own way, butchered others and millions have fled Syria. And we can do all we can as the moral humanitarian nation at taking people and spending money on aid and helping in refugee camps, but we have to be part of the international alliance that says we need an approach in Syria, which will mean we have a government that can look after its people. Assad has to go, ISIL has to go, and some of that will require not just spending money, not just aid, not just diplomacy, but it will on occasion require hard military force. Yeah. Yeah. So Peter Bottomley. Yeah. 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 I think the last exchange is the most important. We, with other countries, have moral and practical responsibilities. My right honourable friend has said that we're presently the only country meeting both the commitment to the world's poorest and on military spending. And I think it would be helpful if you could explain how each helps us deal with the situation in Syria and around it. Yeah, yeah. The, the point I make to my, my honourable friend is if, if, that the spending on aid is vital because you have 11 million people who have been forced out of their homes. Some of them remain in Syria. They need support. Some of them are in refugee camps. They need support. And many are being looked after uh, in Lebanon, in Jordan, in Turkey. And those countries need our help. So the aid budget, I think, which has always been a controversial issue in our, our country, people can now see the connection between the money we spend, the lives we save, and the national security we help to enforce here back in, in the UK. The point I'm making is not to change the debate now about what happens next in Syria, but we just have to keep thinking about the fact that there is nothing in, in the end that will make uh, ISIL go away other than a confrontation which we're seeing in Iraq, we're seeing in Syria, and I think we should be clear that ISIL being degraded and destroyed and ultimately defeated is in not just this country's interest, but in the interest of civilization more broadly. Yeah. Robertson. Thank you. Thank you. Much, Mr. Speaker, the threat level from terrorism is listed as severe in the UK, and there are many challenging uh, decisions for the Prime Minister to take in protecting public safety uh, and for Parliament to consider. It's taken four months for the re-establishment of the Intelligence and Security Committee. Can the Prime Minister explain what role he hopes that committee will fulfil? Um, well, the honourable, right, honourable gentleman is absolutely right that the current level in terms of threat is severe. That means that we believe a, an attack is highly likely. These levels are set independently of government. Uh, and the Intelligence and Security Committee does very important work, and there's a motion on the order paper today uh, to see its re-establishment. And I very much hope that he will be uh, part of that committee and will be able to be briefed in the way that other members of that committee uh, are, are briefed. Uh, is there a role for the Intelligence and Security Committee, which we've already expanded, to do even more to scrutinise uh, the actions of the intelligence services and the government? That may well be the case. As I announced on Monday, what has happened, what we have done in terms of uh, this um, uh, strike against a British citizen in a country against which we are not currently at war, is a new departure. And I think it's important these things are properly scrutinised. I would argue the first way of scrutiny is for the Prime Minister to come to the House, the House to question him. That is accountability. But is there a role for the ISC to look at these things, not current operations, but to look at these things? I'm very happy to discuss that with the new chair of the ISC, who I hope will be appointed in the coming days. Mr Angus Robertson. Uh, much, uh, the Prime Minister talked about the importance of the Intelligence and Security Committee and parliamentary oversight <coughs> and scrutiny. We learnt this week of a new UK policy of drone strikes against terrorist mm -hmm. suspects in regions where there is not parliamentary approval mm -hmm. for general military action. Will the Prime Minister provide all relevant information to the Intelligence and Security Committee so it can conduct a review? Yeah. 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 Uh, as I've just said, I'm happy to discuss that with the chairman of the committee when they are, I said appointed, what I meant to say was elected by the members of that committee, uh, because that is what rightly happens. Uh, th I'm happy to do that. The only proviso I'd put on is that the Intelligence and Security Committee cannot be responsible for overseeing current operations. I mean, the, the responsibility for current operations must lie with the government, and the government has to come to the House of Commons to explain that. 
I am not going to contract out our counter-terrorism policy to someone else. I take responsibility for it, but I think, it's, I think it is important, after these events have taken place, that the ISC is able to make these sorts of investigations. Rebecca Powell. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Speaker. A slight change of tack. Over the past weeks, I have been meeting with farmers across Taunton Dean facing severe difficulties owing to falling commodity prices in many sectors – lamb, beef, arable and dairy. These industries are a lifeblood in my constituency. Could the Prime Minister please give assurances that all efforts are being made to help these industries through this particularly tricky time? Uh, farmers having been campaigning on the streets recently to highlight their, their straits. Well, my honourable friend is absolutely right to, to raise this because low commodity prices are causing problems for farmers here in the UK but also right across uh, the European Union. Um, we led calls in the Council of Agricultural Ministers in Brussels yesterday for urgent action, and there is going to be a €500 million Euro package of measures to help farmers. Here in the UK, we have obviously taken steps to help, which include the grocery code adjudicator to make sure we get a fair deal uh, with the supermarkets, to make sure we do more on public procurement, to make sure that, where possible, public authorities are buying British food because it is of such high quality, and also what the Chancellor said in the budget about making sure uh, we look at the tax treatment of farmers to try to give them a better deal at this difficult time. B. Abrahams. Two weeks ago, the Work and Pensions Secretary's Department not only admitted to falsifying testimonies in Leaflet, yeah, yeah. but they also published data on the deaths of people on sickness be benefit, uh, which showed that they are four times more likely to die than the general population. Yeah. This was after the Secretary of State told this House that these data did not exist. Given this, and his offensive remarks earlier this week, uh, referring to people without disabilities as normal, when will the Prime Minister take control and respond to my call for the Work and Pension Secretary to be investigated for breaching the ministerial code? Well, first of all, let, let me deal very directly with the publication of this data. This data was published because I promised at this dispatch box it would be published in a way that it was never published under any Labour government. That is the first point. And I also think we should be clear about what this data shows. It does not show people wrongly being assessed as fit to work. It does not show people dying as a result of their benefits taken away. If you listen to the organisation Full Fact, they said this. I have to say to honourable gentlemen, two newspapers have printed that fact and had to retract it. So I think actually people should look at the facts. And the fact-checking organisation says this. It was widely reported that thousands of people died within weeks of being found fit for work and losing their benefits. This is wrong. Perhaps you should read that before asking our next question. Mr David Davis. In uh, 2011, the Prime Minister quite rightly confirmed to the House that the Wilson Doctrine, the prohibition on the electronic monitoring of members of Parliament, uh, was still in force. Unfortunately, in July 24th of this year, the Government's own lawyer, Mr James EDQC, stated in the Investigatory Powers Tribunal, in, a, in answer to a complaint from the Honourable Lady, the Member for um, uh, Brighton Pavilion, that the Wilson Doctrine is not legally binding, cannot work properly, and accordingly places no obligations on the intelligence agencies. This is clearly inconsistent with the Prime Minister's previous statement. Can he clarify the status of the doctrine to the House today and confirm it has real meaning? I, I, I've got nothing to add to comments I've made about this uh, issue before, but I'm very happy to write to the Honourable Gentleman and, and set out the position. Caroline Lucas. Mr Speaker, the ongoing harrowing refugee crisis is fuelled by conflict, which in turn is powered in part by the global arms trade. The UK has supplied weapons being used in many areas from which people are now fleeing, including Yemen and Libya. So in the week that London will once again host the largest arms fair in the world, isn't it time the government recognised the link between arms sales and the terrible tragedy that we're seeing unfolding around us? Yeah. I would say to the Honourable Lady, first of all, we have some of the strictest rules anywhere in the world for selling arms to other countries. But if she thinks that the reason why so many people are leaving, fleeing Syria is something to do with the arms trade, the fact is it's because Assad is butchering his own people. 
people. It's because we've got an Islamist extremist terrorist organisation running a large part of two countries, Iraq and Syria. Those are the problems that we have to confront rather than pretending it's about something else. Andrea Jenkins. Topic UK is a social enterprise in my constituency that is expanding into South Yorkshire and London. The Northern Powerhouse and Devolution should be about developing growth and prosperity right across England. <laughs> North of England. <laughs> can, can I ask the Prime Minister when he hopes to see a metro mayor in our area and how devolution will stimulate growth for businesses like this in the region? Well, I think there's a real opportunity in this Parliament to make some decisive steps towards rebalancing our economy and building the northern powerhouse that we have spoken about. And a big part of that is devolving power to local uh, government and specifically to mayors that can be accountable to their local communities and have new powers and new resources to drive economic growth in their areas. We've already had over 30 areas making proposals as well as city regions and I think this is a very exciting development for genuine decentralisation in our country, and I very much hope West, West Yorkshire will be in the vanguard. Dr Ailey Whiteford. Yeah. 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 Mr Speaker, I'm sure the Prime Minister will be aware that over 900 uh, people at the Young's Fish Processing Factory in my constituency in Fraserburgh currently face the threat of redundancy. But there's a perception across the industry that the UK Government has been encouraging and supporting the company to relocate many of those jobs to Grimsby. Goodness. So can I ask the Prime Minister, Goodness. what's he going to do to support the workers in Fraserburgh? I'm aware of this uh, issue, not least because the local members of Parliament in the Grimsby area have come to see me to talk about uh, this industry. Look, what matters is that we go on being an economy that wants to attract businesses and growth and jobs. And that means keeping our inflation down, keeping our taxes down, it means keeping our corporate taxes down, and I would also argue it means keeping our country together. As MP for the Faithful City, may I associate my constituents with the tributes paid earlier to Her Majesty the Queen. Um, the Worcester's Guildhall, which she visited on her Diamond Jubilee, will next week be hosting a jobs fair at which over 130 employers will be recruiting. Um, in Worcester, we have seen unemployment at its lowest level ever and youth unemployment down by two thirds. But can my right honourable friend update us on his plans and his determination to finish the job by eliminating youth unemployment? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm very grateful for what my honourable friend is doing and for what is happening in Worcester. What we've seen is the employment rise by nearly 2 million and the unemployment rate fall for 25 consecutive months. But I think we have to be frank, the job is now going to get harder as we dig down into those people who've been out of the labour market for a long time, who have challenges for getting uh, jobs, and we need to work really hard to make sure the apprenticeships, that the training and the help is there. And that's why what's happening in Worcester is so important. Who Cox? Can the Prime Minister tell the House whether he ha thinks he has led public opinion on the refugee crisis or followed it? I, I would simply argue that this government is doing the right thing and we've done it consistently. I, I, to be frank, to be frank, public opinion hasn't always supported the 0.7% that we give to, of our GDP to aid. And even in the most difficult of economic circumstances, it was this government, led by a Conservative Prime Minister, that kept the promises that we made to the world's poorest. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Will the Prime Minister join me in welcoming the Chancellor's announcement of funding to kick-start improvements to the North Devon Link Road? Uh, and does he agree with me that this is a vital project if we're to continue with the economic growth and jobs which his economic policies are already delivering? Well, well one of the things that uh, struck me on the many visits I made to his constituency in the run-up to the last election is that the communities in North Devon and the coastal towns of North Devon are completely reliant on the North Devon Link Road. It's an absolutely vital artery, and that's why it's so good that there is this £3 million of funding to develop the business case for improvements. Uh, and what I will say to him is we'll keep on this because we know just how vital this road is. Yes. Every year, thousands of people have medical emergencies outside of hospitals. When it's a cardiac arrest, every minute without CPR or defibrillation reduces survival chances by 7 to 10 per cent. First aid is a true life skill. The majority of teachers and parents support the teaching of emergency first aid in schools. Will the Prime Minister look closely at my private member's bill, which aims to do that 
and make every child a lifesaver. Now, I will certainly look closely at her private member's bill because the truth is that um, this is a real lifesaver. The availability of a CPR equipment, whether it's in village halls or in pubs or in schools, can save or sports clubs can save many, many lives. That's why there was a million pounds in the budget to be used for buying defibrillators for public spaces and schools and for training. And I'm sure that many schools will want to take advantage of this. Nigel Adam. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yeah. The, the Prime Minister will be aware that the new owners of Edgborough Power Station in my constituency are consulting over the closure of a station which provides 4% of the country's electricity. This comes on top of the announcement that Ferrybridge Station, adjacent to my constituency, is to close, and also Long Gannett in Scotland. Drax Power Station is taking legal action against the government over changes to the tax regime. The reality is that the, these power stations are being taxed out of existence, and we are potentially walking to, into power capacity issues next year. Will the Prime Minister meet with me to discuss a way forward for this station and the industry and for the hundreds of people in my constituency whose jobs are under threat? Yeah. I'm very happy to meet with the Honourable Gentleman. I've discussed this issue with him before. Uh, I believe we do have sufficient capacity in our energy market, but it's something that I have meetings regularly with off chairman energy ministers to make sure that is the case. I think we do have this difficult situation of wanting to see, uh, over time, a phasing out of unabated coal. That does need to happen if we're going to meet our, our carbon uh, emissions. But also, when it comes to replacing in these power stations uh, coal uh, with some of the renewable technologies, is we need to make sure this is affordable. We've got to make a judgment about how much we're prepared to add to consumers' bills, because in the end, this has to be paid for. Nick Dakin. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The UK steel industry is currently facing huge challenges. Um, in Scunthorpe, 25,000 people rely on steel. Will the Prime Minister call a steel summit to, to show that his government will stand up for steel and take the action necessary to secure its future? Well, I, I've discussed this issue with the Honourable Gentleman before, and uh, I'm sure we will meet and discuss this again. And what the government can do is help the energy intensive industries with their energy bills, and we put £35 million towards that. We've also set out in our infrastructure plan the infrastructure needs of the country so that steel consumers can plan for how much uh, needs to be produced, and we'll go on doing everything we can to support this vital industry. Mr. Andrew Bingham. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The railway station of Gloucester and Hadfield in my constituency are the third and fifth biggest, biggest and busiest in Derbyshire. The constituents who use these stations have just been advised of the change in the available rolling stock. What can my right honourable friend do to ensure that the successful bidders for the new franchise could continue to offer as good a service as they are available now, and maybe even better? Well, I think my honourable friend is absolutely right to raise this, and the whole point about the franchise process for the new Northern franchise is to see an improvement in the services. We've already spoken about getting rid of the Pacer trains, which I know is going to be very popular in the, uh, the north of England, and we're going to be adding an extra 1,500 services a day. We want to increase the morning peak capacity by a third, and as I've said, see those outdated Pacer trains uh, retired. I think that is a good programme and one we hope we can secure through this franchise. Smith. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Experts say that delivery of the electrification of the main line between Paddington and Swansea is slipping. So how is the Prime Minister going to get this project back on track and budget by the delivery date of 2018? We are committed to this electrification all the way to Swansea. Uh, we're making record investments in our railway line, and many of us, including members opposite, were privileged to be at Newton Aitcliffe to see the opening of the Hitachi factory that will be providing the state of art tra state of the art trains, not trains built in Japan, but trains built here in Britain with 700 new jobs in the northeast of England. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Does my right honourable friend recall? In the debate about Syria two years ago, there were voices around this chamber who argued that the conflicts in Syria and elsewhere were nothing to do with us and they shouldn't involve us. Isn't it clear that the failure of Western security strategy in the Middle East and elsewhere is the main driver of this migration crisis? And can I endorse uh, his requirement for a full spectrum? Uh, response to ISIS, and would he consider actually setting this out in a comprehensive white paper in order to lead world opinion? 
Well, well first of all, what, what I'd say to the um, uh, 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 Honourable gentlemen, but we should be very clear about who is responsible for the refugee crisis in Syria. And I would lay it firmly at the door of Bashir Assad, who assaulted his own people, and ISIL, who even today are throwing gay people off building, raping women, terrorising communities, and driving people uh, to take to the road and leave their country. They are the ones responsible. But he makes an important point, which is that when we don't uh, involve ourselves in these issues and take difficult decisions, that is a decision in itself. And it has consequences. And that's what I hope we can debate and discuss in the coming months. He talked about white papers and the rest of it. There are many different ways of presenting this uh, information. But I think we need to look at all the arguments for what he would call, and what I would call, a comprehensive approach to these issues. Daniel Zeichner. Mr Speaker, our sixth form colleges do a great job, but they're not protected by the education ring fence. That means a sixth former in my constituency has lost almost 20% of their funding over the last five years, in some places almost 30%. What's the Prime Minister got against sixth form colleges? I'm fully in favour of sixth form colleges, and that's why, actually, unlike previous governments, we've gone quite a long way to equalise the funding between sixth forms in secondary schools and sixth forms in colleges. We've made a lot of progress. Um, we're just, day, just days away from the start in England of the world's third largest sporting event, the Rugby World Cup. In addition to wishing luck to all of the home nations, will the Prime Minister agree that this represents a great economic opportunity to my town, whereas we welcome visitors from around the world to the birthplace of the game? I certainly am looking forward to the warm welcome that Britain will give to rugby fans from around the world. I'm happy to uh, wish luck to all of the home nations in what is going to be a, a uh, compelling contest. It's always worth noting that, uh, of course, this dispatch box was the gift to the House of Commons of the people of New Zealand. And while we're very grateful for their gift, and we want one of the home nations to win this tournament. Yeah. Last but not least, Mr Nigel Dodds. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, the Prime Minister will be aware that the situation in Northern Ireland, already grave following the IRA murder uh, in August uh, in Belfast, has uh, escalated to new heights with the arrest today of the chairman of Sinn Féin in connection with that incident and indeed other leading members of Sinn Féin. We warned about this earlier this week. We have now reached the tipping point. Indeed, in my view, we have gone beyond the tipping point. The Prime Minister is aware that the First Minister has met the Secretary of State this morning. He has put a proposal to her. Does he now accept that unless he and others take action, that we are in a very grave state as far as devolution is concerned? We want to see government, but only those committed to exclusively peaceful and democratic means can be in government. The people of Northern Ireland cannot be punished. It is Sinn Féin who should be dealt with. Does the Prime Minister agree? First of all, I agree with him that we are at a very difficult phase uh, of these discussions in in Northern Ireland. I obviously can't comment on uh, the police operations that have taken place, but let me say this. There is no justification for paramilitary organisations and structures in Northern Ireland or, indeed, anywhere else in our country. They are a blight on our society. They are not wanted. They should be disbanded on every occasion and on every side. The only thing I would appeal to... Uh, members in the DUP, the UUP, SDLP, uh, the Sinn Féin members who don't take their seats in this House. As someone who sat on those benches and watched while the peace process was put together and the power-sharing arrangements were put in place, it was one of the most inspiring things that I've seen as a human being and a politician, to see politicians put aside their differences, put aside concerns about appalling things that have happened in the past, and decide to work together. And the appeal I would make to all of you is please have that spirit in mind. It was an amazing thing you all did in Northern Ireland when you formed that administration and that assembly. We'll do everything we can to help you. But let of the nobler processes and the great noble principles that were put in place in the past, and let's do it again. Order!